Okay, great. So again, just welcome to everyone here to the Stronger uh, Together Showcase and Panel here at the UCF Libraries uh, Diversity Week. Um, we are so excited to have you all here. And just an overview of the event. Um, the idea behind this is for us to just learn about the UCF community. There are just so many different uh, people, knights, uh, friends of knights that are here around, you know, where we live and, and you know, we have all of these connections. And so I think it's just so important for us all to come together and kind of um, work out different solutions and kind of showcase what we're doing in the community. I feel like the most important thing is to just be aware of what's, what's going on in your community. Sometimes we just don't know. So the idea behind this event is to show off, you know, our nights, um, our faculty, our staff, our friends, and, uh, and kind of talk about what we can do uh, for the future of our community. Um, and the idea too is that everyone that you're going to meet today, uh, they are local resources. These are people that you can go to, you know, if you want to get into um, tech, into the arts, into sewing, into fashion, um, learning more about local history. Um, this, is the, this is the time to, to do that. And we have so many great people that are willing to, to share that knowledge with you. Um, and then the, the final idea here is to, you know, engage new partnerships. So if you're out there and you want to, you know, connect with one of these organizations, do it. Um, everyone here is just so welcome to, to, you know, coming together and to just seeing what, you know, what we can do together in the future. So a little bit about myself. Who is this guy? My name is Glenn Samuels, 2010 UCF alumnus, Bachelors of Arts and Humanities, currently the Community Outreach Chair for the College of Arts and Humanities Alumni Chapter Board. Um, also co-chair for the Association of Southeastern Research Libraries, uh, their Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force. And you can find me at the UCF campus. Um, I am the Senior Library Technical Assistant um, at the John C. Hitt Library and a member of the Diversity Week Committee. So once again, welcome, so happy to have you. All right, and like I shared again, the whole idea is to um, showcase these current nights, uh, alumni, faculty, staff, friends, um, and partners in the community. All right, so the very first, and actually before I continue, I do wanna to um, shout out and just thank the Office of Diversity and Inclusion uh, for having this event every year. It means so much, you know, it's so important that we talk about, especially this year, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I want to uh, give a shout out to the Nicholson uh, Student Media um, organization who's out and they're, uh, they're actually here at this event. Thank you so much to Haley Traina um, for covering this event. Um, I want to thank all the presenters, of course, for being here, the College of Arts and Humanities uh, for assisting with putting this all together. And of course, finally, the uh, UCF Libraries Diversity Week team for um, kind of giving me the, uh, the ability to, uh, to do this event. First time we're ever doing anything like this. But yes, and then I also want to share too that uh, we have Amy, who is our uh, department head of the CMC, Curriculums Materials Center. She is my co-host. So feel free to, if you have any questions or comments, um, go ahead and type those in and we'll address those as they come in a little bit later. All right, so yes, our first organization is Form to Fashion. And give me one moment. It is headed uh, by Andrew Brown. He is an author, educator, entrepreneur, focusing on the intersection of fashion and education in Central Florida. Andrew is an alumnus of University of Central Florida, class of 2009, was a part of the O team in 2008. Andrew is an associate professor of math at Valencia College. He's the co-author of African Americans in Fashion History, 40 Icons Who Helped Shape the Industry, and currently works with students individually and through various after-school and arts organizations introducing students to the basics of sewing and construction. He is the co-owner of Luxury Stationery and Illustration Company at Paper Bar Co. and co-owner of Form to Fashion where he develops and implements fashion-based curriculum for Central Florida's youth. Jason Radcliffe is also a co-owner of Form to Fashion. He is an author and all around serial entrepreneur with a central focus on the fashion and art industries in Central Florida. He's the co-author and illustrator of Africans, African Americans in Fashion History and currently works with various after school and arts organizations, introducing students to the methods of sewing and fashion design and how these skills can develop into an innovative career in arts and entrepreneurship. 
He is the co-owner of luxury stationery and illustration company, The Paper Bar Co., where he designs and illustrates fashion-based artwork. He also co-owns the fashion education program, Form to Fashion, where he directs and leads fashion-based educational programming for Central Florida's youth. And now I'll turn it over to Form to Fashion. Good afternoon, um, and thank you so much for having us to our esteemed colleagues um, and fellow panelists. My name is Jason Radcliffe. Um, I am the co-owner of an educational program here in Central Florida named Form to Fashion. And I'm Andrew Brown. We're both so excited to be sharing not only this presentation, but being able to connect with you all, uh, whether through Zoom or outside via programming and for you to get to know more about what we do. And Glenn, you can go to the next slide. Um, again, putting a face with the names and the positioning. Um, we have been running this company for about four and a half years. We saw a huge need um, for assistance uh, with arts and design programs for high school and elementary uh, level students. And we really understood that we are preparing students for all areas of education. However, when it comes to arts and fashion design, there is a lack of resources for young people to prepare them for college or the next level um, and entrepreneurship. So essentially that is what Formative Fashion does in filling the gap. Um, we were hit um, extremely hard uh, working throughout Central Florida when COVID and the pandemic hit. Uh, we operate out of four counties, so Orange, Osceola, Lake, and Seminole. Um, and being based here in Orange County, with programming really coming to a screeching halt um, right before spring break, kind of sent our industry into a tailspin. Um, and so what we were able to do during the pandemic, Glenn, if you can go to the next slide, was create interactive virtual programming. Um, this was really our huge pivot moment where we were able to create various learning opportunities via Zoom, um, via Teams, as well as uh, Google Chat, where we created new ways of learning um, for students across um, our four county territory. Uh, during that time, we introduced a really fun program for K through five called Zoology, where they learned about various um, zoo animals, but also how to hand sew their own little stuffed animal that had a early childhood learning and mental health component. We encourage students to use um, those projects as coping tools. So when they're angry, when they're upset, when they're sad, when they're scared, um, being able to have this little plush pet to help you know, cure or quell your anxieties um, is really, really interesting that we were able to do that and fun um, for the students during the pandemic. Um, Glenn, if you can go to the next slide. So a huge component of working with children is education. And so our company motto is education first. And throughout all of the techniques, you can see some pictures here of some of our kids working and some of the projects that they've created. A big component of fashion design is measuring and understanding fractions and math and sizes and how that corresponds to various educational aspects. So not only do our students read about fashion, they learn about the history of textiles and example, this term, they're learning about cotton and the role of cotton in America, but they're also reading and, and learning about all of these components that go into the fashion industry. And then they use those new tools that they learn to create a project, whether it's a gator's pillow, it should be a knight's pillow, but they <laughs> like it to be gators, and, or an emoji pillow where the inside is a recording, or you can see there's a student holding a tote bag that they made. And some of our students are using patterns to create pants and shirts and jackets. So our company model really is education first and they use that education to create fashionable items. 
And so what was fun and very much uh, a turning point for our business and our motto, Education First, we were able to launch educational resources um, on our site. So if you were a subscriber or a parent that was interested in continuing programming, you were able to log on with a secure password and access reading materials, math materials, um, science and technology materials that apply to the fashion industry. And so when we say education first, we are teaching a very robust, well-rounded curriculum that ties in all areas of learning. And what we find to be most effective is if your child is interested in arts or fashion, and they're not doing well in math or they're behind in their reading. We have paired our program and curriculum to model FSA. So your child will find reading exercises that are applied to an industry or an art form that they're interested in to get them more engaged in reading, in math, in science. We also introduce um, early chemistry and, it, and how it applies to textile design. Um, and so it's really fun because we get to see so many young people's lives change, but also we're getting them engaged early on into the fashion industry. Glenn, if you can move to the next slide. Mm -hmm. So we also found it extremely important um, to allow students to find their creative niche. Um, and really what we have done is we have curated some of the best in the business. Um, and we wanted people to see the diversity in the fashion industry. It's not very often that you see African-American or Latino X faces um, within fashion and in the forefront. And so what we've done is we have partnered with some of our nearest and dearest closest friends and colleagues um, within the fashion industry. One of them um, who was our very first cover um, star is Alexis Bennett, who at the time was the first, is the first African-American woman to hold the editorship of e-commerce for Cosmopolitan. Um, exciting news, Alexis has moved on to become a commerce writer for Vogue magazine, which is a huge feat um, during this time. But we have access to um, Project One Rate, All Stars, Anthony L, um, Styx Matthews, who is also a blogger in Glossier, if you're interested in makeup and fashion production. So there's so many amazing people that we've been able to partner with and get an inside scoop on their life, on their career, and really allow students to glean from their mistakes, to glean from their knowledge, to glean from someone in that position where they wouldn't normally have access to the editor of Cosmopolitan or the official blogger for Cosmetics Glossier or a Project Runway alum and all-star winner. We have really created this community for free that students who are interested in any um, industry in fashion can really pull from these stars um, and these industry insiders. Um, Glenn, our next slide. Another resource that is actually brand new for the fall is the book that we both co-wrote and Jason illustrated. It's actually a coloring book, African Americans in Fashion History. 40 icons who helped shape the industry where we amplify those black voices that have a have had and currently do have a huge impact on the fashion industry and it starts in the 1700s with Thomas Jen Jennings excuse me who holds the patent for dry cleaning and it goes all the way up into contemporary times with people like Tyra Banks and Tyson Beckford and Tyler, who recently shot Beyonce for the cover of Vogue. And so this was our way of providing an educational tool, but making it fun as a coloring book for our students, but also for adults as well. And next slide. A part of our pivot has also been creating customized curriculum for various organizations that we work with, whether it be in the private school sector or in the community sector with some of our partners, like the Boys and Girls Club of Central Florida. We have been able to create a customized curriculum that creates access for every child um, that we reach. Just one of our 
uh, programs is a student resource guide, which introduces cotton in early America and the contributions that African Americans have made again to fashion history. So it was very important that during this time we saw the need um, and the outcry for diversity to amplify Black voices, but also to create a community and access for every child um, that we teach. Um, Glenn, you can also move to that next slide. Um, ways that you guys can get involved with our programming, with our organization, and um, it's click, download, and share our free resources. We have really, again, curated these stories, created these interviews, reached out to industry insiders to create resources for not just young students, but college students and high school students as well. So the easiest way to get involved is again, to click download and share all of our resources um, and the extraordinary things our company is doing, doing, doing excuse me, during this time. Um, and our last two pages um, will share with you just some contact information, uh, follow us on Facebook, our website. Also, you can see some of the fun projects that our students work on via Instagram. And then, of course, I am Jason Radcliffe, the co-founder, CEO, and Senior Program Director for Form to Fashion. And I'm Andrew Brown. I am the Director of Education. This last slide just shows how you can directly get into contact with us. Uh, there's our email address and our phone number. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jason and Andrew. Wonderful. All right, our next organization is Orlando Museum of Art. Uh, Molly Lawson is the Associate Curator for Community Engagement at the Orlando Museum of Art. Molly oversees youth and family programming at OMA, which includes school tours, art camps, various workshops, and much more. Molly holds a bachelor's degree in art history from the University of Central Florida, as well as a master's degree in museum studies from the University of Oklahoma with a focus on museum education. David Matheson is the Associate Curator of Education and Outreach at the Orlando Museum of Art, where he develops and facilitates programs for diverse audiences of all ages, backgrounds, and abilities. David holds a bachelor's degree in studio art and English and a master's degree in business administration from Rollins College. He's currently completing his doctoral coursework in the Texts and Technology Program at the University of Central Florida, where his research broadly focuses on digital curation, public history, and museum education. All right, Molly and David, take it away. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to UCF and of course to Glenn Samuels for organizing today's showcase. Um, my colleague Molly and I are just so excited to be sharing with you uh, how the museum, how the Orlando Museum of Art goes about building community. And if we could just move on to the next slide, Glenn. So again, I'm David and I am the Associate Curator of Education and Outreach. And I am also currently a Knight. I am in the Text and Technology PhD program. And everyone, I am Molly Lawson. I'm the Associate Curator for Community Engagement. And as Glenn said, I am an alumni Knight. Glenn, you're good to go to the next page. And so we really want to st start by um, explaining that it has always been the museum's mission to inspire creativity, passion, and intellectual curiosity by connecting people with art and new, I art and new ideas. Um, and with that, the purpose of the museum's education department has been to curate pure programs for diverse audiences of all ages, backgrounds, and abilities. For example, we have programs like Arts the Spark that caters to adults with memory impairments. And we have other programs such as Stroller Tours that give attention to caregivers and infants. And then other community access programs that really focus on underserved audiences in, in the Central Florida community. And so that is something that the museum has been and will continue to do. And so Glenn, you can go to the next, next slide. And so as Molly shared, we do have these priorities already in place and we had, had that perspective going into the COVID-19 closure, but 
in spite of that, we had very few digital resources on hand. So we faced a, a huge challenge of converting our on-site, in-person programming to a virtual format. And so Molly and I had the opportunity, um, or were at least expected to, rapidly iterate solutions uh, that, that could engage audiences virtually. And so we did this in two, one of two ways. We either adapted programs to a virtual format, so existing programs that we already had in place, or we tried to develop new programs, new initiatives. Um, and as an example of the that latter point, we have Paintings and Pandemics, which was a video lecture series. It was a conversation series between Molly and I and the galleries where we discussed a work of art whose date of creation corresponded with a past pandemic. And so this was a way for us to really hone in on the current cultural climate, uh, this, this upheavals that we were seeing in, uh, as a result of the pandemic and connecting it with the past. We both agree that the history often for, serves as a, a stability, a, provides a sense of stability during these kind of cultural moments of upheaval. And so we uh, tried paintings and pandemics. That video series was released online. We uh, sent it out to our membership first, and then we uh, sent it to out on uh, social media. And then we also tried a whole social media campaign called Museum from Home. And these were short three to five minute videos where we discussed a work in the collection, highlighted a piece from the museum. And Molly and I have no video editing experience. We are not camera people in any way, but we were able to shoot all of these using our iPhones from home, um, edit all of them on our phones, export them, caption them. We just learned how to be a one-stop shop video production team, all from the comfort of our own home. Uh, but it was just those two are examples of, of ways that we created new initiatives to engage new audiences. Both of these series were very successful in terms of the numbers of people that we were able to, to engage and the distances from which we were, we were able to engage um, them from. So, so we had many international viewers and then Molly, you want to right, and and so as David mentioned before, um, we also were able to adapt some of already uh, solidified programs, programs that we would have otherwise done either on site at the museum or. Um, by go doing outreach. And so for example, we adapted our program called Book in a Look, which is normally an on-site program where I would read a book in our gallery space to a group of children, and then we would explore a work of art. And so we adapted that to be a virtual experience uh, where we created pre-recorded videos of me doing that exact same thing. And then in addition, normally during this time of year, we would be offering outreach to schools, which involve a museum educator going to a school and presenting in front of a class. And since we can't do that at the moment, we have instead created a virtual experience where a museum educator presents a virtual presentation to students, and then students can participate by asking questions via a video format. And so that program is called Art Detectives. Um, Glenn, you're good to go to the next, sl next slide. And then to speak to inclusivity within the collection, uh, really in the, the wake of George Floyd and the protests this summer, we uh, as a museum um, took the initiative to add to the collection two pieces that represent global diversity. Um, we have always had an interest in collecting globally and representing kind of diverse perspectives, especially within our contemporary art collection. But these two pieces, I think, kind of speak to that um, in a nice way. So Kyle Meyer's work on the left is from his Unidentified series. And this is a photographic weaving. It, it features a portrait of a gay man taken from Swaziland, where, of course, homosexuality continues to be oppressed, repressed. Um, and, and so these men who pose for Kyle, who is an American artist that has spent a, a great deal of time living and working in Swaziland, um, he's gained the trust of these individuals and 
they are very much brave in uh, posing for Kyle for these various portraits. And so he takes those portraits and utilizes them for these kind of photographic portrait weavings. Um, so we just purchased that piece. And then the one on the right is a work by the artist Bisa Butler. She's an African-American artist, but she is best known for her quilting work. And she completed a portrait commission for Time Magazine this past March for their Women of the Year um, uh, edition. And so she, this portrait is of Wingari Matai, who was the Kenyan uh, social and environmental activist who was the first African woman to win a Nobel Peace Prize. And so both of these are, are works that we just recently added to the collection and are both featured in our current exhibition, Voices in Conversation, which our curatorial team put together this past summer, of course, in, in response to uh, the, the protests that we were seeing. And so um, this exhibition features contemporary works from the collection that, again, speak to kind of this idea of diverse voices and inclusivity. And Glenn, if you want to go ahead and flip to the next slide. And so um, first and foremost, we would like to give a special thank you to UCF for sponsoring our resource center. Um, UCF students have free access to educational materials in our resource center. And these materials inc include things such as art kits and trunks, as well as a variety of art history books. So I encourage you to come and take a visit uh, to our resource center. And lastly, if you're looking for an internship, the museum might be the place for you. Uh, depending on the time of the year, we have marketing internships, development internships, curatorial internships, and of course, education internships. So if you're interested in interning at the museum in any of these capacities, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, our emails are provided right here on the slide. And with that being said, Glenn, you can go to our last slide. We want to just thank you. <laughs> thank you for having uh, David and I today. Um, and we feel honored to uh, be to join this panel with our fellow pa panelists today. Thanks so Wonderful. much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Molly and David. All right. Our next organization is Bethune Cookman University. And their representative is our very own Brandon Nightingale, um, 2016 and 2019. Um, Masters of Arts alumnus, is the archival coordinator and adjunct professor of African American history at the University, a historically black university in Daytona Beach, Florida, where he oversees the research and the archives on the university and its founder, Mary McLeod Bethune. Brandon serves as the communications manager for the Association of African American Museums, Emerging Museum Professionals Leadership Committee, he is finishing his Master's of Science degree from Florida State University in December. So Brandon, take it away. Thank you, Glenn. And uh, th I wanna thank everybody, uh, the rest of the panelists and everybody for uh, joining us today. Uh, this was a great idea and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, from the rest of our panelists. Um, as Glenn introduced, my name is Brandon Nightingale. I'm joining you today from uh, Daytona Beach, uh, Florida, here at Bethune-Cookman University. Um, the school actually just celebrated 116 years uh, on October 3rd, um, so we're still still excited about that. Um, and the school, just a little bit about the schools, it is an historically black college or university, and it was founded by Mary McCall Bethune uh, with five uh, African-American girls in 1904. Um, so I work at the school as the archival coordinator, and I'm also the, uh, the uh, an adjunct history professor. Um, you can go to the next slide, Glenn. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I really want to, today I really want to talk about the journey um, that, I, that I've been on um, really since I started at UCF in, in 2012. Um, and that's, that's sort of the reason why I'm here and sort of show how everything is sort of connected and, and working together. Um, so I've, I've met a lot of people over, my, over the years at UCF. I, I got started in 2012. Um, I came to UCF. I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. Um, I came sort of following my brother, uh, Timothy Nightingale, who's also an alumni, a proud alumni. Um, and uh, I was sort of 
sort of lost. I, I came here electrical engineering, or I came to UCF electrical engineering major, and uh, it wasn't until I got into um, the general education courses um, and really the history courses, the, the one in particular taught by uh, Professor Jim Clark, and that was what sort of swayed me into history, and I, I've just been really hooked ever since. And also had the opportunity to uh, minor in writing and rhetoric, uh, which enhanced my uh, writing skills tremendously um, it, during my undergrad and undergraduate career. Um, and also during undergrad, I, I do want to give a shout out to the one of the other panelists, uh, Dr. Scott French, um, who I took one of his history courses that that really sort of changed uh, a lot of my perspectives on, on uh, history in general. One of his film courses, and um, and that was a really good course and. I really got to get some hands-on experience in terms of what I could possibly do um, in the future, and sort of, sort of, a, sort of a uh, a way outside the classroom. And I'll and I'll get into that in a second. So, uh, after shortly after um, I graduated in 20, 2012, and I went straight into the public history uh, program, which is ran by Dr. Scott French. Um, so I, I had to uh, become uh, very well acclimated with Dr. French um, because I, I ended up having to work with him quite a bit, and um, had an amazing time, um, great, great program. I have no, nothing but good things to say about the, pro the program from the faculty to the staff, um, really showed me and helped me uh, get to where I am today. So I definitely, definitely wanna make sure they, they are recognized. Um, in the program, the main things that I was able to receive, I got some firsthand uh, experience in, in oral history interviews. Um, that's, it's because I really love just the idea of interviewing people and getting their stories, but you got to see sort of the background, uh, what goes behind actually interviewing people, you know, the preparation for the questions, the transcribing process, which I don't think a lot of people like. Um, it, it's just, just a good way to um, get my feet wet and see if this is something that I wanted to do. And uh, my, my experience, um, I actually was able to do an internship with Riches, and then that led to an assistantship. Um, that I was able to do, um, I believe it was around 2018, um, uh, which was work for the UCF Veterans History Project, Community Veterans History Project. And I got to go around the, uh, the Central Florida community interviewing veterans. And um, and we would house that information through uh, one of the repositories at UCF Riches, which is ran by Dr. Connie Lester. Um, so just, just the experience and overall training that I was able to receive um, while in the program really helped me get to where I am today. And then on the last thing on the slide is uh, uh, my job, or oh, I'm sorry, I skipped over the Florida State. So I'm actually also a, oh, you can go back, Glenn, I'm sorry. Um, I'm actually a, a Florida, uh, I, I'm a student at Florida State University, as Glenn mentioned. Um, really, this has been a, a different experience for me. It's, it's been online. The program has been completely online. I have to take the classes at night, but I'm really enjoying it. Um, it's, it's showing me sort of how to how to operate inside of a library. You know, it's so much that I did not really realize until I got to where I am today at Bethune Cookman University. Um, and this degree is sort of helping me navigate and I, it's gonna be useful um, in the future, I know. But right now I'm just sort of uh, concerned about getting through the courses. And then uh, lastly, the Bethune Cookman University. So I joined the staff here in 2019, um, last year, or I think it was about April. Um, I, I went right in and I, I became the assistant archivist and I am now the archival coordinator. So I oversee um, everything in the archives. We're located on the second floor at Bethune-Cookman University. So, you know, if you're ever in Daytona and want to stop by, you can always mention me and uh, I can show you around. And I also help give tours um, at the historic home uh, that was that was owned by Mary McCall Bethune that, just, that, that is on the campus. Uh, so you can go to the next slide, man. And once again, the journey. Uh, so this really is going to sort of talk about how I got to where I am uh, currently in in the uh, as, as the archival coordinator and, and adjunct uh, history professor. It was really a mesh between uh, museums and archives. Uh, so it was pretty interesting how I got here. So in 2017, as a part of the public history program, we were asked to you know go out and get an internship. You know, if you couldn't get one, um, the history program, you know, they were able to provide opportunities, but I wanted to, you know, go out and, and get my own. So I was able to secure an internship uh, with the Smithsonian's African uh, National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. 
And I was there for about three months and just had the time of my life, met so many people. I was there under the leadership of Dr. Kruoski Salter, who was the military history, he was the guest military history curator at the time. I actually got that internship because uh, uh, Dr. Salter's son, uh, Corey Salter, he went to UCF with me and I was able to, uh, he was able to get me in contact with his father. Kind of crazy how that worked out. But just an example of how, you know, you want to use your network, um, especially uh, you know, attending UCF with so many students. You always want, you're always meeting people. Uh, so you want to make sure that you're using that network. Um, so I was able to go out there for three months and just met a lot of people, um, was able to volunteer with an organization I'm very involved with now, the Association of African American, uh, Association of African American Museums. I am currently the uh, communications manager for the EMP group. Uh, so do a lot of stuff there, but I really, uh, I was able to take the training that I got in the classroom and apply it quickly um, in my internship. And that's something that I, I tell people a lot is that I sort of had to go from the student to the teacher really quickly. Um, and so I, that was in 2017, had a great time in Washington, uh, met a lot of people and then a year later in 2018, I got to do an internship um, with uh, Mary Rubin in the uh, with the University Archives, which is where the special collections is in the library. And this is sort of where I found my passion um, with working with Mary. Um, it's sort of we didn't really know what we were going to do at first, um, but I'm glad, you know, Mary was a great she was a great, great person. And she was sort of the first one to sort of guide me and take me and show, okay, this is what an archive is, well, this is what archivists do. And that's Mary right there in the middle, uh, in, in the picture in the middle. Um, she was just awesome. And I was able to uh, create the Black Student Union um, history. And that's currently on the, the library's website. Um, and that was just awesome. Had a great time doing that. I got to look at some of the primary uh, source materials really coming from the uh, Central Florida future, the uh, Central, uh, uh, UCF's uh, newspaper and just a lot of good stuff there. I was able to, like I said, create the history and I still get um, hit up about that to uh, to this day in terms of just people wanted to know more. And I, you know, I still have a lot of notes uh, from back then. So you take the uh, museum side for the Smithsonian and you mix that with the, the archives and you get me here which is at Bethune Cookman University. So I, I am the archival coordinator. I oversee, um, like I say, the archives day to day. We handle uh, requests, anything to do with Mary McLeod Bethune, um, you know, her life and her legacy, which is just, I mean, I'm amazed every day by what I'm learning about this woman. She's just, just a amazing, amazing woman. And um, I also, uh, we also house everything on the university. So anything dealing with the university or the university's presidents, um, uh, we, you know, I, I, I may get hit up about, and I have a, a all student staff, about five students that are working with me. And I'll talk a little bit about that when I get to the COVID piece. Um, but also here at Bethune-Cookman University, I help um, um, facilitate tours at the uh, Mayor McLeod Bethune Historic Home, which is on campus. Um, it's sort of, it's turned into a museum. And uh, I just help sort of give the tours and help uh, with the upkeep over there with the curator of uh, Miss Ebony Sampson. Um, so once again, you take the mix of the archives and the museums and, you know, you get me here at Bethune-Cookman University. I was able to really get a, mi uh, a mixture of both. And now it's, it's what I do. Um, so you can go to the next one. Okay. okay. And dealing with COVID, um, this has been interesting because I just, you know, sort of got in my position. I've been the archival coordinator for a couple months now. I, I, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, a couple months now. And... Um, it's been different. Uh, we, I am back in the, on the university. Um, as of right now, we are not having any visitors come in. So everything has been going digital in terms of uh, my, the, the archives is located on the second floor of the library. So nobody's allowed on the second floor except for me and the students. So it's actually been pretty good. We've been able to get a lot of, you know, requests done a lot of, we're able to get a lot of work done because there aren't as many, um, you know, interruptions or people coming up and asking questions and things. We're able to just kind of get the work done. Um, definitely keeping the social distancing going. Um, really, my sort of resources have been the FSU courses because a lot of the courses have to deal with, you know, how do you deal with COVID in, in libraries right now? So that's been good. And also expanding to that HBCU archive network. I've, I've met some archivists 
um, at other HBCUs and, and sort of see, okay, how are they doing things? You know, how are they going digital? What things are they implementing? So that's been good. So like I said, it's all about building that network. And uh, since I've been here, I've been able to meet and get a lot of good advice in terms of um, just different things to try out. Um, so that's, it's, it's been, a, it's been a, a process, but it's, it's been a fun process. And you can hit to the next one, go ahead. And giving back, um, this has been, you know, I'm very big on this. I try to give back where I can. Um, I, I, I'm making it a goal of mine to give back even more. Uh, starting next year, I just got to figure out, you know, different ways and different different ideas. Because I'm a part of so many organizations now, just, just have to figure out, you know, where I put my time. Um, but the first will be the um, College of Arts Humanities Alumni Chapter Board. Um, this is just an amazing, another amazing organization. Um, this one is read, uh, is led by um, the uh, alumni chapter, excuse me, uh, Director of Alumni Engagement, uh, Azela um, Santana, and she has just been amazing, amazing person to work with. Um, I actually came to her sort of looking to get more involved with museums, and uh, she sort of steered me in the right direction. Uh, another person I sort of consider as a mentor, and uh, she, she was able to give me, you know, just great advice, and I was able to come and join on uh, as the uh, student liaison when I first got involved with the chapter. And uh, they just do so many events. Um, I haven't been able to do too many events because of you know, other engagements, but I still do sort of monitor. And I'm, I'm currently a member at large uh, with, with the uh, College of Arts and Humanities Alumni Chapter Board. And they do a, lot, a ton of you know, uh, events where you're able to give back. Um, and I also make it a, a, a goal of mine to give back to uh, one of the scholarships that I won. I was able to win um, the alumni chapter scholarship um, when I was getting my, working on my thesis and that scholarship helped pay for some of my travel as I went around uh, to different archives uh, for, for my thesis research. Uh, so I make it, you know, a goal of mine to try to give back to that specific scholarship, um, you know, to sort of say, hey, this is something that I received that I want to, you know, make sure that somebody else has that same opportunity. I'm also a member of uh, Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. Um, this is an organization that was founded in, in 1914. Um, just a great uh, service organization. We have three uh, principles of brotherhood, brotherhood, scholarship, and service. And so we try, we always are trying to give back in the community. I currently live in New Smyrna Beach, Florida. And um, of course, I, I'm, I work here in Daytona. So I've been very active um, with the Sigmas out here in Daytona and I know during COVID we were doing a um, sort of feeding feeding families uh, during COVID we were giving out free meals and and that was something that was that was really well we tried to get some some uh, publicity behind that and, and was able to get a couple uh, uh, cameras out to that so uh, always trying to give back um, through you know different organizations and services and um, and uh, mentorship that's something that I take you know very seriously whether it's getting the mentorship, um, I know the College of Arts and Humanities alumni chapter, um, they, they have a mentorship program. Um, I was a part of it. And um, it's a really, really great way to get involved, you know, way to give back to the students. And also, you know, I'm, also, I'm always taking advice. You know, anybody wants to mentor me, whether it be archivists or other people in the library space, um, you know, I'm, I'm always looking for that, for that knowledge. Um, so you can move to the next one, go ahead. Okay, and this is the last one, um, because, you know, you may look at me and say, hey, you know, you're so busy and, you know, doing this, you're doing that. And I, I actually, you know, I, I would call myself a busy person also, um, but it's important. And this is something that I, I'm really, uh, you know, big on making sure you live it, you're making sure you're living in the present. Um, you know, there's so much going on right now in the world, you know, you got COVID and every, you know, Seems like every time I look up, somebody has passed away. I've had a couple, uh, you know, deaths in my in my family here. Um, just make sure my advice is going forward is to try to live in the present. You know, try to focus on what you can. You know, I got a lot of things on my plate, but I try to you know deal with what I can uh, at the moment, and, and that comes with preparation, um, of course. But you also got to make sure that that you, you know you're living you're living in the moment. Um, so, uh, and that's that's going to conclude my presentation. Once again, thank you, Glenn, and thank you to the rest of the panelists and everybody tuning in. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Brandon. Thank you so much. Our next organization is Black Orlando Tech. Hi. And 
we have the representative Rose Legis. Uh, she was born in Miami and raised in Delray Beach, Florida, and is the proud oldest daughter of Haitian immigrants. She received her BS in industrial engineering from UCF in 2005, and then worked at Kennedy Space Center for 15 years. She is an engineer turned tech entrepreneur with over 16 years of expertise and recently started her own tech company, RL Engineering and Tech Solutions. Rose uses her experience to speak at various tech conferences, mentor black youth, and provide guidance to young people of color who are just starting their professional careers. She's currently a mentor coordinator with the Greatest Investment Empowerment Program and the Strategic Partnership and Resources Chair for Black Orlando Tech. She also teaches BOT's Data Analytics Cohort and coordinates the organization's Tech Startup Series. She also volunteers within her community, sharing her lessons learned from life experiences and her STEM expertise and holds positions on several nonprofit boards. Rose, it's all yours. Awesome. Uh, one, first want to say thank you for having us here. Uh, I'm really excited uh, um, on being part of this uh, UCS Diversity Week. All right. Um, so uh, I am Rose Legis. I am part of um, the Strategic Partnership and Resources Chair for Black Orlando Tech. Um, and I'll start off with just giving uh, a little bit more information about myself. So then we can move forward. All right, so I am a UCF alumni. I graduated at UCF in 2005 with my BS in um, IE. Um, after I graduated, I, um, I actually got an internship with a uh, small engineering company uh, that had a large con that had, uh, was part of a large contract at Kennedy Space Center. I then moved on to a bigger uh, um, company at Kennedy Space Center and worked out there for about 15 years in various engineering roles. Um, in 2019, during our furlough, um, I decided it was, um, you know, time to kind of go after my dream of owning my own tech company and uh, uh, started my own tech company, RL Engineering and Tech Solutions. Um, and uh, the key focus of my company is basically using the uh, different areas, engineering and tech areas that I have expertise in um, um, to provide uh, services. Um, to uh, small businesses and commercial and gov government contracts. Uh, I joined, um, I, I participated, oh, you can go back, sorry. I'm going on, let's see. All right, sorry. Um, I participated in Black Orlando Tech in 2016 when they first started up, uh, but I joined the organization uh, in 2019 as the um, you know, committee chair for uh, partnerships and resources. Uh, reason I joined uh, Black Orlando Tech is I was attracted to the safe space that they provided for minorities um, in tech and the passion and commitment that they had uh, in regards to empowering our community and diversifying the tech skilled workforce. Go ahead. All right, about uh, Black Orlando Tech. Black Orlando Tech is a nonprofit organization. Uh, we're focused on accelerating minority economic advancement through tech careers. Again, uh, it was founded in 2016 um, by a group of um, tech leaders who were attending uh, different tech uh, um, conferences lo uh, here locally and uh, meetings and just saw a lack of diversity and wanted to create a inclusive safe space for minorities in, in the tech uh, world. Um, one of the things that we, um, you know, we're aware of and we we focus on is the, you know, the studies show that, you know, this community, minorities um, um, and more specifically uh, Blacks are um, dramatically underrepresented uh, within the tech skilled workforce. And so um, our strategy to close those gra uh, gaps is uh, we work through our grassroots and direct to community initiatives. Um, that include partnerships, um, basically cultivating partnerships with uh, local um, and national uh, organizations, businesses, academic and professional and government organizations. Uh, through programs, uh, we facilitate safe and solution-oriented dialogue and programming among underrepresented groups and tech and pipelines. Uh, we basically work on developing pipelines for minorities to leverage 
career and entrepreneurial resources uh, throughout Central Florida. Go ahead. All right, our mission statement is uh, we are a, Black Orlando Tech is a nonprofit organization working to increase the awareness, activities, network, and resources for local minorities who pursue careers in technology by over 10,000 people by the year 2025. Again, studies have shown that this community is dramatically underrepresented within the tech uh, skilled workforce and our, or, or our organization is seeking to close these gaps through our grassroots and direct to community activities. Okay. All right, how has BOT been affected by COVID, D, uh, diversity uh, and inclusion uh, um, efforts? Um, one, we were forced to pivot. Uh, when we first started off the year, uh, we, our plan was uh, to have um, um, monthly meetings uh, where we would uh, have meetings on emerging, emerging tech topics. Um, and within those meetings, uh, we would basically um, bring in um, and highlight local entrepreneurs, startups, leaders, um, offer a place for networking and collaboration and fellowship. Um, and so obviously when uh, COVID happened, we weren't able to have those physical meetings anymore. Um, and so we pivoted to have a online platform, which worked out because it allowed more people to attend our meetings. Um, obviously our meetings were held, you know, um, at a certain location. Um, it was always like, you know, the, uh, the third Wednesday of every month at six. And so, you know, certain, you know, people, sometimes people would want to, be able to attend our meetings, but weren't able to due to, you know, um, um, just not being able to be there. So pivoting and um, transitioning to an online platform allowed a lot more people to uh, uh, see our webinars and the different content that we had and, and participate in the different initiatives that we had going. Uh, so we had to get creative in identifying content to keep the community engaged. We initially had, um, predefined or pre-identified uh, areas to discuss uh, at our monthly meetings. What we realized is, um, number one, you know, so the areas were that we, you know, looked into is like transportation, robotic um, process automation, um, uh, uh, blockchain. And so what we realized is when, when the pandemic hit that people weren't really focused on those uh, things and there were more pressing issues. Um, and we wanted to uh, be a sort, a resource for our community. And so we had to identify what exactly was uh, our, the topics and issues that our community is um, experiencing right now. So, you know, one of the things is um, uh, we had a webinar on the um, best practices for working from home. Um, we identified different tools, um, tech tools, software, just different things that could um, that the, our people within our community could incorporate in regards to working from home and creating that um, you know the best uh, um, environment you know when it comes to that um, we I, uh, what we came across access or more access to free text resources like software tech courses certification services and programs. Um, and so as we came across this, we shared this information with our community, um, especially with the certification and courses. Uh, we encouraged uh, group study sessions and, and just tried to uh, communicate these free resources that were being kind of, you know, thrown out there to our community. <laughs> and also, um, take, you know, with, for ourselves, uh, take, it, take um, advantage of some of these free resources that we would have previously had to pay for. And, um, and, you know, as a nonprofit, you know, uh, whatever we can get uh, that makes it easier for our community, we'll, we'll definitely uh, look into. Uh, we transitioned our initiatives to online platforms. Uh, we restructured and pl uh, our planned partnerships and collaborations. We had planned partnerships with um, some local tech companies or organizations. And we basically had to restructure what that looked like. Uh, instead of having these physical meetings, um, we basically offered, so basically we kept the partnership because we didn't want to lose that, 
but we were able to, um, you know, restructure it, redesign it so that way we could still continue and offer um, that opportunity to our community and, um, and also make it very easy to attend and participate. Um, primarily, uh, our, you know, what we encountered uh, in regards to being affected by COVID was positive. Uh, we saw an increase in sponsorships, especially from, you know, individuals and local small businesses. We saw an influx of requests for collaborations and partnerships. And we saw increased um, opportunities uh, for the bot community. All right, go ahead. All right, the solution. So how is bot giving back? So bot is giving back uh, through a... Um, through multiple um, initiatives that we have. And those initiatives have been growing, again, through this pandemic because there's been so many opportunities that, that have been placed in front of us. And so um, those include, and um, you know, to inspire um, our community through monthly talks on emerging tech topics. Uh, one of the things that we, um, we aim for is a diverse, um, community. And when we say diverse, we, our community includes people who are not in tech and who are in tech and at different stages. And so that's the, um, one thing we focus on. And so when we have, uh, our monthly talks on different topics, we make sure that it's the topics are diverse. So that way we can always engage, um, you know, those different, um, the different, how our, the different makeup, you know, within our community. Um, our topics range from um, actual tech topics like transportation, you know, in the local um, in the local or um, Central Florida area to um, like tomorrow. Our we, our monthly webinar is going to be on mental health um, because we had, you know, as we sat down and talked, we identified that as being something that we needed to focus on and discuss and also include in our planning. And so we'll be talking about mental health and we have. The people we have coming on will be talking about yoga, um, mind control, um, uh, eating um, in terms of your health and fitness and things like that. So we try to be uh, diverse in the topics that we bring in. Um, we provide training through tech workshops and classes. We have our tech cohorts where we have um, experts uh, from the local community who volunteer to basically teach um, this a certain skill set to uh, those who uh, sign up. Um, the the skill sets range from data analytics. That is the, I actually uh, was over, uh, am over that tech cohort um, to AWS, to uh, backend development, just different tech skills. And we have that open to um, anyone. I mean, there's certain requirements that we identify that, hey, you need to at least be here um, to do well in the course. But in my data analytics cohort, my uh, uh, students consisted of college students to um, healthcare administra um, administrators um, to a real estate agent. And so offering that type of um, uh, technical workshop to where anyone can take it and learn these skills is what we're, you know, what we focus on. Um, and, and those workshops go from teaching the beginning parts of, of the text the uh, skill down to the certification. So right, we started off with the beginners and right now we're on our third round of those uh, workshops where the, our participants are actually going to go for certifications. So within one year, our, participant, our participants wait, went from <clears throat> having either beginning or no knowledge of that tech skill to now going for a certification. Uh, we provide entrepreneurial uh, development program uh, for participants to gain the skills needed to launch a successful tech startup company. I am over that. It's called the um, Black Orlando Tech Tech Startup Series. It's like a pre incubator. Um, and what we what we identified is that um, a lot of the incubator programs out there, um, basically, as a tech startup, you kind of need to be at a certain uh, uh, place in your your journey and um, there was no resource for those who had not gotten there yet this is it was a you know it was created for those who had ideas yet had no clue how to vet them or what was the next step forward um, these are people who have 
the expertise in that tech area, but have no clue about running a business. And so we identified all these um, gaps and wanted to fill that. So the Tech Startup Series basically gives our participants the basic business um, knowledge that they need. And we link them up with experts and speakers that have volunteered their time to teach them about funding, um, um, anything with the legal aspects of uh, starting up the business, marketing, um, um, launching, you know, those different areas. And um, it's a six month program. <clears throat> and then um, lastly, we create partnerships and collaborations with local tech communities that will include a pipeline for minorities to leverage their career and entrepreneurial resources. So again, we've been um, we're working on a number of partnerships and collaborations with uh, different community um, tech organizations or companies ranging from Universal and EA Sports to our some of our local community colleges and universities. And what we've done um, or our goal is to create this uh, pipeline to where we can identify um, uh, potential employees, interns, and um, basically provide them not only what are these companies looking for to hire you, but see if we can provide those resources if our um, if our if those people in our communities, our participants, don't have them. And so that includes resume building, um, interview skills. If it's uh, um, like with our tech cohorts, if it's certain, if it's a certain skill set or certification, and so those are the type of pipelines that we're trying to create between these big tech companies here in local um, in Central Florida, um, down to uh, the individuals within our community. All right, go ahead. All right, so for like Orlando Tech. Um, diversity, diversity means embracing and considering everyone's unique lived experiences. It goes beyond race. It includes diversity of thoughts and perspectives. Every industry, including tech, really is stronger when conversations about inclusivity shift beyond just talk to action and real change. Black Orlando Tech is committed to doing our part by helping launch bright minority minds into tech careers and entrepreneurial endeavors. And so if you are ready to help us launch those 2,000 bright minority minds into tech, uh, definitely join us in the mission. We're always looking for more members, speakers, experts, volunteers, sponsors, and community allies. And so I've listed a couple ways to con connect with us. Um, you have our email, um, our website. If you go to our website, there is a um, subscription list that you can sign up for to get more information, um, our Facebook page. I think one of the biggest uh, things is our Facebook group. You can join our Facebook group. We share it like so much information in there um, from conferences, from free certifications, um, free courses, anything that we uh, get our hands on, we share that group. And also we uh, share jobs. Uh, we get a lot of, uh, we're a lot of uh, hiring managers or even people who own their own companies, tech companies connect with us. and specifically are looking for people within our community. And so we post that information and then also, you know, create that, um, basically connect the, um, our community to those individuals. And then we have Instagram and Twitter. And so, um, again, if you are looking to join and help in any way, please definitely reach out. My email, I believe, was at the beginning. Um, and you can email me um, and we will get back to you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rose. Wonderful work BOT is doing. But, all right. Our next presenter or organization, sorry, is our University of Central Florida, home of the Knights. And our representative here is Dr. Scott French. He's an associate professor of history and director of public history at the University of Central Florida. He is author of The Rebellious Slave, Nat Turner in American Memory, and has contributed essays to several edited volumes, including Jeffersonian Legacies, Media, Culture, and the Modern African-American Freedom Struggle, Pride Overcomes Prejudice, A History of Charlotte Bill's African-American School, and Marked, Unmarked, Remembered, A Geography of American Memory, a film based on his research, That World is Gone, 
race and displacement in a southern town, won audience favorite for best short documentary at the 2010 Virginia Film Festival. That same year, he received the University of Virginia's Black Community Advocate Award from the Black Student Alliance, Black Leadership Institute, and the UVA chapter of the NAACP. He is a member and chair of the Zora, Zora, Zora Festival's Academics Committee and local organizer for its 2021 Afrofuturism Conference at UCF's downtown campus. Take it away, Scott. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, everybody. This is a great pleasure to be here. And uh, good, great to see some familiar faces, Brandon and David and uh, Glenn. Um, thank you. This is great. So I'm going to keep my presentation short. Um, as you can see, uh, I, my, my current uh, position is at the University of Central Florida. I've been here since 2011, and uh, I direct public history. And uh, that, I think, is a great place to start here because it's all about uh, looking at how history, putting history to work in the world, right? And understanding uh, why history matters. And it's through that engagement with the public, connecting the public and, um, and, and what we do as historians that, that I think activates all of the, the thinking about uh, building communities, diverse communities and collaboration and conversation. Um, so next slide, slide please. Okay, so the first thing that I, when I think about, you know, takeaways here, I came up with three. One is, of course, mentorship. And you heard this from Brandon and others, but it's very, very important. And I had my mentor, if you could go to the next slide, uh, Reginald Butler. Uh, he was the director of African Americans, uh, the, the Center for African American Studies at the University of Virginia, where I got my PhD. And um, he was so uh, critical in framing my consciousness. Uh, he was a a very accomplished researcher and scholar with a deep, deep commitment to community. Um, he, uh, as a scholar, respected the knowledge that lived in the community. He was a founder of the Central Virginia Social History Project, which uh, in, engaged with genealogists and lay scholars who many professional historians would not have really invited to the table. Um, he wanted to institutionalize the conversations that took place there and as director of the Carter G. Woodson Institute that he directed, uh, created a series of sort of um, opportunities, seminars, workshops, programs that would bring us together, scholars working within the academy, uh, scholars working outside the academy, to work on projects. And if we could go to the next uh, slide, uh, this leads to the next step, which is partnerships. Uh, Reginald's vision was to sort of incentivize partnership between universities and the communities in which they reside. There had often been a, a very kind of tense and, and uh, I would say almost a hostile relationship between the University of Virginia and the African American community uh, around it, uh, largely based on history, a long, long history dating uh, to the era of slavery. It's a much older school and a longer uh, relationship. Uh, Reginald wanted to sort of create, um, to, to find a way to break down those walls. And uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, he and I together, uh, I was interested in digital history. He was interested in social history. And we were all very interested in creating these opportunities. So we would create, we created a project in which we would partner up with local uh, genealogy groups, uh, uh, students in classes, we would bring together faculty with an interest in particular subjects to create web-based web projects, resources that could be used by anyone interested in researching uh, the history of race and place in Central Virginia. This is an example up on the screen. It's, two, it's from 2002. It's still used today. All of the materials that, that students and uh, community members contributed are available uh, and used frequently. Um, if we could go to the next product, next slide, please. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we became more and more ambitious about the kind of collaborations that we would engage in. One of the issues that the community was uh, wanted to address was the, uh, the uh, erasure of African-American history, the displacement of African-Americans in Central, in Virginia, in Charlottesville through urban renewal, and the destruction of Vinegar Hill, which was the black business and residential district at the heart of Charlottesville. And so working with um, archivists, 
Uh, thank you, Brandon, for, for, for really highlighting the importance of archivists. We discovered a collection of photographs of this neighborhood that had been taken by the appraisers before the neighborhood was demolished. Photographs of every single building in the neighborhood. And what we set out to do was to create a kind of virtual Vinegar Hill and a, and a portal through which to access information about the neighborhood. And on this page that you're seeing, you see some of the kind of high-end digital projects that were created with uh, partner, through partnerships uh, with the Historical Society and through class projects. Uh, very exciting, but not as impactful as I would have liked. And so could we go to the next slide, please? Uh, my next thought here was we really need to find a way to bring the voices of the people who experienced this uh, into the story more directly. Um, and, and again, Brandon was talking about oral histories. Uh, we had a number of older oral histories that had been done in the 1980s. We wanted to go out and conduct some new interviews and create a short film that would put the voices at the forefront. This was not going to be a film in which you had a kind of uh, authorial voice speaking over the top. So, uh, you know, this was going to be told, the story told by the people who lived this. And we created a, and we went for a grant. And going for a grant, this is what I mean about partnering up. When we went for the funding to support this, the partners included uh, local groups, the public housing area residence group, uh, the genealogy group were written into this grant as co-producers of this project. And uh, out of this collaboration came uh, a 20 minute film that I think is incredibly moving uh, and, and I, I guess I can judge what the, the, you know, the people's voice on this. It won a uh, audience favorite at the Virginia Film Festival for Best Short Documentary. And I think that's because it was such a powerful story, uh, powerfully told. Uh, we have taken the story into other uh, platforms, uh, exhibits, walking tours. Uh, but, but to me, this was really a very exciting way to sort of think about the ways you can take an idea and address it in all different kinds of forms through these really important collaborations. Next slide, please. So uh, out of these projects, these public history projects, uh, is, is the idea of scholarship that, you know, we are working in research universities and our goal is to advance knowledge, uh, to uh, not simply share information, but to, to break new ground. And so if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, in some way, some of what I do is, uh, you know, in, in collaboration with, with local, uh, communities, uh, I, I, I've done a lot of research, for example, on the historic black township of Eatonville, and I'm very much involved with preserve Eatonville community. Out of that has emerged a series of articles, but what, what's exciting for me is not the articles as such. Those are important. Those are stable. They can be cited. Uh, and they can be built upon. They can be challenged, but they are in print. What's important to me is that to activate that kind of scholarship in public settings. This is an example on the screen. Just last week, um, St. Luke's Church has a, 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 a program, a theater program, in which they want to address uh, issues of, um, of of concern to us now, of, of race and uh, Black Lives Matter and and, and raise awareness among their congregation. And so they invited um, two pastors uh, to join a, a young filmmaker, uh, Sean McLeod, who's a UCF uh, graduate theater, uh, who, who had created a, a short film. And as part of this event, uh, which was hosted on Facebook Live and other sites, uh, the, the idea was that the congregants could tune in, watch the film, and then we would have a conversation afterward. And I felt a little out of place here because here I am, you know, speaking as a kind of academic, but uh, what was important was the weaving in of the together of the lived experience of, of the, of those who were um, dealing with these issues on an everyday basis, right? And putting that in a, a long historical context, both as, as told by the participants here at this table, but also drawing on the research that we had been doing in Central Florida. Um, to me, that's when it becomes a kind of, you know, true conversation that uh, involves different kinds of knowledge, 
all of which is based in uh, in deep experience and engagement, but different ways of coming at the same issues. Um, so this this is the, these kinds of opportunities. I think are what make public history so important, um, and what what really energize uh, you know diversity, right? To put it into into uh, into action, right? That these are conversations that continue beyond this event. I guess the last thing I want to say is that um, for the COVID era, um, I'm working closely with the uh, Preserve Eatonville community and the Zora Festival to think about how to uh, continue uh, to engage audiences in the work of, uh, of the festival in the academic side, this the theme is Afrofuturism and, and it's, it's a big, exciting uh, new way of thinking. It's a lens, critical lens through which to think about cultural production. But what's interesting for me is to think about how to turn the festival into a year round course. And so right now that's my big collaboration, working with uh, Dr. Julian Chambliss at Michigan State University, Michelle Robinson at Spelman College and other uh, academic uh, committee advisors uh, to reinvent this festival uh, as both a face-to-face -face event and in a course that anyone anywhere can can participate in. So uh, that's all I have today, and I'm really excited to uh, hear from all of you and ask you all some questions. But thank you for giving me this, this chance to say a few words about my work and uh, and representing UCF. Thank you so much, Scott. And yes, we are going to go into our panel discussion. Of course, time has gotten a bit away from us, but don't worry. If you can stay, of course, um, you know, stay logged in and, and, and join us. If you have to go, we understand. Um, but I had a, a couple of questions just um, off the top of my head, and we're also going to open it up to everyone. We see that there has been um, a lot of activity in the chat, and we appreciate that. Um, we are going to get to those questions. I believe that some of them have been answered. Um, and at the very end, we're going to have um, another contact page. So if you have questions directly that you want to talk to um, each presenter or organization um, about, feel free to reach out to them if you cannot um, address them today. Um, all right. So my question is for all of us here, what is the best way to partner with another organization? And everyone is able to, to chime in whenever they'd like or if they'd like, not like. Just be sure that... Um, this is Rose. Sorry. Okay. So this is Rose. I'll, um, the first step I think is to reach out. Um, and yeah, that's a lot of, uh, a lot of our partnerships or, you know, future partnerships, uh, basically started off with an email saying, Hey, we're interested. This is what we want to do. Um, and then we move on from there. Um, so until that initial communication is like made, um, it's going to be, you know, really hard to, um, to kind of bridge that together. And also, so not only for the person who wants to partner up to reach out, but for the people on the receiving end to be open to collaborations. I agree with that wholeheartedly. Exactly, just reaching out and and being, you know, sharing your voice, but also be willing to listen. You know, and and sometimes unlearn certain habits or stereotypes or ways of, of thinking um, about others, and just be open. That's how we move forward. Yeah, thank you, Rose. I agree. Anyone else? If not, go to the next one. How do you nurture partnerships? What have you found to be the best ways? Uh, I, I would say make, making sure that the uh, you know the partnership is a mutual you know mutual uh, relationship. So um, a lot of times, you know, somebody may be going into something with just one goal in mind, and that's you know making their side better or, or having their, their best interest. Um, so you want to make sure that whatever it is that you're doing in terms of the partnership, that it, it, it's something that can benefit not only your organization, but, but um, you know, who, who, who you're talking with. I think that's important. Um, I absolutely agree with that. I think one of the biggest things um, that we've been able to do is continue to build on rapport. Um, and once you find that synergy with someone that you want to, build or continue relationship with, just really focusing on how you continue to develop and build on that partnership, on that relationship. Um, small things, it, it's COVID-19, checking in, following up, you know, hey, we haven't, you know, spoken in a while, I'm just circling back. 
um, but also keeping tabs on organizations that you want to partner with. So if there's something interesting going on in the organization and you want to be involved, ask that very small, simple question. How can I be involved? How can I join you in your mission, um, whatever that mission may be? And also add, be authentic um, in regards to like, you know, even with those who have reached out to us, um, we, we can tell the difference between someone who really wants to partnership partner with us because of uh, what we're, our initiatives and we have uh, um, uh, lining up with our, our own goals versus someone doing it uh, for publicity or, you know, whatever. So, you know, if you connect, if you're connecting with a organization to partner up, know about the organization, you know, know about their initiative, know about where they stand. Because if you don't, then to me, that's not, that's inauthentic. And so it kind of starts off that relationship on a bad footing. I totally agree with that too, especially, you know, as we've all witnessed within the past months, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of um, the, the, the face of, you know, wanting to be diverse and a lot of, you know, ads and, and, and uh, marketing and a lot of, you know, social media hashtags, but that authenticity, you know, we can tell when it's, and that goes for anyone, you know, we can tell whatever group it is, you can tell when it, someone who's positioning themselves to be a part of or wanting to know more about you, if it's more about them or if it's really about connection. So that's a great point, Rose. I didn't think of it, but as you say it, agree a thousand percent. Mm -hmm. um, next question. Um, and this actually came um, kind of, I don't know, it was kind of neat how this all happened, but um, I'd like for the discussion to kind of occur. But um, how did everyone here meet? And we already kind of talked about it, but I'd love for the, uh, the audience to, to kind of hear about this. I can start. <laughs> um, so I met, strangely enough, I met Scott French at the UCF Library, John Hitt Library. Um, and he had just uh, put up a great exhibit um, in the library. If you ever go there, just past what's now the Lib Tech desk, huge panel, um, wall panel, where um, any organization can um, exhibit their work. Um, he just put up an exhibit and he was there with his kids and um, came over and asked, he's like, um, hey, would you mind taking a picture? Um, and I said, sure, not knowing who he was or anything like that. Um, we had a nice kind of like conversation and then it was like, you know, see ya, you know, take care. Um, and then I was asked by Azela Santana, and I'll piggyback on Brandon's um, praise of Azela. Thank you so much, Azela. It, it, this really wouldn't have come together if it wasn't for you. But, um, but strangely enough, Azela, Azela asked me to join the alumni board. Um, I was voted in as community outreach chair. And, um, and there was Scott French, <laughs> which is really cool. Um, and then Scott and Brandon turns out that they know each other. And, um, and then Rose, I met Rose through Kelda Sr., she and I had done a panel for the Orlando Museum of Art back in August. Um, and so uh, I just think it's really neat. And I think a lot of us have already been saying this, that it, all it takes is an email. Be genuine, be authentic, but take an email, to send out that email, to send out you know, that text and look at what we have today. You know, um, It's so important. Um, and I believe uh, Lara, or Lara, Lara, sorry if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly, but she highlighted what, some, Brand, what Brandon said, which I think is so key. Use your network. Um, when it comes to discovering solutions for our communities, it's it's so much about you know what we know, of course, but who you know, and um, it's it's a matter of um, stepping out and not being too shy, or be too fearful, um, and just being brave. And um, and you know, sky's the limit. You know, who knows what we can do by us all just talking to each other and just you know seeing what what next steps can be for the future of our communities. Um, if anybody wanted to add on to that, go ahead. Sorry if I took too, too long. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, Glenn and I actually went to UCF together. Yes, oh goodness. When this uh, <laughs> opportunity came up, Glenn reached out yes. and Jason actually, I'll let you talk about how <laughs> you know Molly and David. Um, hi everyone again. It, it, this again, synergy and rapport really is what makes the world go round. Um, I had met David, uh, via email. Uh, he asked me to join the, uh, panel review board, uh, for seniors for OCPS for our students. 
And then I work closely with Molly uh, at OMA, uh, teaching sewing and fashion various art programs um, with their summer camp. And so when Glenn kind of connected everyone, me and Molly were like, oh my gosh, like, hey, we're, we're you know, we're gonna be on a Zoom meeting together. And it, it's just, again, like Rose said, authenticity, building rapport. You will really find that in this area of learning, there's a lot of synergy, um, no matter how large or how small um, our organizations are. There's some line of communication and some single thread that threads us all together. And I think that is because we all have a common mission to activate, to educate, and to be inclusive. Mm -hmm. I think that is the one takeaway that I've seen. We are all wanting to create inclusivity within our communities. Um, and I think that is what creates this amazingly diverse panel of entrepreneurs and educators and curators um, and students. So again, amazing how we were all able to kind of sync with each other um, and learn more about what we're doing in the community. Beautifully put, beautifully put. I, I agree, goodness. Um, and you know what, we can go ahead and skip these last two questions. I feel like they've, they've been answered with all of our discussions so far. Want to get to all of our questions in the chat box. I know we have like three minutes, but we can take a lot, you know, take more time, no worries. Um, I know that Laura had, and I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly, but she had quite a few questions. So if we could go ahead and, I don't know, Amy, if you wanted to yeah, start. Brandon, uh, yeah, Glenn, I did take them down in, in sort of an order, but I think this would be a great place to answer um, one of Laura's questions because we were talking about networking. Yes. And her question was, it was directed at Brandon, but um, she asked, how would you recommend someone who is introverted to use a network? Because reaching out to people when you're introverted can be a difficult a difficult thing for an introverted person to do. So, um, Brandon? You know, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, um, it's something that I'm actually working with my students on uh, um, now because they don't, you know, they're not me. And, I, and I'm trying to, to get them to understand uh, you know, how, how to, how to, you know, reach out. And so you have to sort of get in where you fit in, I, I would say, and sort of, uh, wh wh where they're comfortable. Uh, so the example I'll give is, um, you know, I have students here that work in the archives and, you know, I'm trying to help. Most of them are, are, uh, upperclassmen, either, uh, juniors or seniors. And, um, you know, they don't necessarily want to reach out to, you know, somebody that I may suggest that may have a job opportunity for them. So I have to sort of, or they have to sort of find out, you know, what is it that they are comfortable with and that they feel, you know, okay with, you know, reaching out to. So um, I come across a lot of, uh, uh, here in the archives, a lot of uh, stuff on my hometown, Jacksonville, Florida. And so uh, some of my students are from Jacksonville. And so uh, originally, you know, they didn't want to reach out or anything in terms of any sort of job opportunities. But when I said, hey, we have some researchers from Jacksonville, you know, that that would be interested in, you know, and coming to the archives and things like that. And now all of a sudden, hey, you know, it got their interest now. Oh, I know where Jacksonville is. I know where this person stays. I know where that is. So and now sort of now they are engaged to the point now they're coming back to me asking, you know, who else can we get in contact with? Uh, so I think it's it's, it's uh, you know, finding where, where, they're, where they're the most comfortable. That's, that's great. Great advice. Um, yeah, glad I you don't have ask. small talk. <laughs> <laughs> so having something where you can say there's there's this researcher in this area, but then of course, how do you as a, a person say, I have interest in this area, or I have background in this area, or I have skills in this area, and I'm not reaching out to you for brownie points, but I don't know a lot about your area, but I still want to use what skills I have to help. I say, say it just the way you said it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like I, I'm very big on being real and just being, you know, and um, there's so many things going on, like, you know, just the way you said it, no fluff, no anything, just exactly how you said it. And it's coming, again, authenticity. And I think anybody, my belief is I would take that positive and connect. Mm -hmm. As long as I know how, you know, what, what you're looking for, how you're, you know, how you're approaching, what you're 
you know, we can we can go from there. So and I would say be intentional, right? Like really have an intent when you're reaching out. Mm -hmm. Um, the power of intent is huge. So again, I'm a very direct emailer. I am yes, no, many thanks, and moving on. Um, because right now people are busy. Entrepreneurs, um, educators are even busier than they've ever been before, right? So be intentional. And one thing that I love about where we are right now in 2020 is the digital era is at its peak, right? So so this is the perfect time, I think, you know, as millennials, as young people, we say slide into the DM. Um, and excuse, excuse my slang, but DMs and direct communication has been some of the biggest ways that big business is pivoting, mm-hmm. right? Macy's is sending influencers instant messages and DMs saying, hey, we're ready to work. We, we want you to push our product. So be intentional. Really think about what it is that you stand to gain and also what you can glean. And then what can this partnership or this strategy do for you? Because I think we also have to understand that each of us play a major role in the big machine. So you as a student, you as you know someone who's looking to offer your skills, you have something to offer. Be confident in that. Believe in the resources that you hold at your fingertips. And again, I cannot stress enough, be intentional. Thank you. Thanks for the advice. I'm going to go back to mute now. (laughs) Jason, I just want to say I so respond to your positivity. It's just (laughs) so wonderful. I mean, I have really struggled the past seven months with just like a crippling cynicism, if I'm perfectly honest, yeah. because this is a really intense time. Um, and, and it doesn't help to be in that space and to, to no, have yeah. this current political climate, right? But um, I do think, and, and listening to all of you today has given me a lot of hope. Um, yeah. and, and partnerships that network just really helps facilitate those, those next steps, that next uh, just... <sighs> I don't know, positive moment. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I will say just kind of speaking about networks, that sense of trust that you build with a community partner comes with being upfront and being honest, which has already been said, but also follow through, right? It's been Mm -hmm. so important for me when I'm working with a community partner because we get so many different offers to have an organization that approaches us or an individual that approaches us uh, be uh, be someone that is going to follow through in the way that you say from the beginning, right? So set yourself a reminder that you need to follow up with an email or things of that nature. It's just so important to have that um, because as, as Jason could have put it, <laughs> we're all so busy. We can all get lost in the shuffle. You know what, David? For me, I have to stay in that headspace, right? Because there's so much work to do and we've got to move. And I am a very, especially as, as having a, a business partner, I am very high energy um, and I am constantly thinking, moving, working. So anytime that I feel like I'm getting into like that cloudy space, right? That, that space of like what's going on politically, socially, you know, economically, there's so much. Um, I really stop and say, is that helping me get the work done? right? The biggest thing is do your work. All of us have been committed with a charge in this world to do our work. And if I take too much time to sulk and look to my left or look to my right, I really realize I'm off focus and I'm not doing my work. And so we all take those times to lick our wounds. I encourage it. You know, it's it's self-healing. But remember that we've got work to do. Right. We all have a mission that we're on this earth in our roles, in our positions to get done. So my charge to the students, to the alumni, let's get to work. You know, we don't have time to stop and and cry. We can cry later. Cry and work. And that's what I tell my (laughs) students. Cry and work. (laughs) Love it. Yeah, Jason, you were absolutely wonderful. And yes, we all agree and we all applaud. Got to get to the work. 
And um, I don't want to take too much more of our time. I thank you so much, presenters, for, for being here. I do want to answer, at least have us all chat about Haley Trainer's question. Very important, very profound here. She asks um, to everyone, how do you overcome being rejected or being underestimated? Oh. <laughs> um, if you, how do you overcome rejection? I, there's a moment where you get rejected. And of course, no, you, no one likes to be rejected. So you take a moment and you reflect. But like Jason said, at some moment, you have to stand up and realize that may not be the opportunity for me right now. Where is my opportunity? Mm -hmm. And you get up and you look for a solution that may not be directly in front of your face. And it may be that you take one step forward that leads you towards the solution, right. which is maybe five, six steps forward. So you always are able to respond how you want to, but you have to stand up and then take that one step forward. And I was having a conversation with a colleague, you know, I, and we were saying, do one thing. If you can do one thing towards that, do that one thing. And it always leads you to the next thing. And I will tell you this, celebrate the no. Yeah. Celebrate the no like there is no tomorrow. Um, and I tell my students this when they're applying for college, especially how competitive, and David and Molly, you guys know how competitive Parson and Savannah College of Art and Design can be. Listen, you're going to hear it. It is a natural occurrence. You have been told no from the time you hit this earth. You'll be told no a million times. Celebrate those no's. Because those no's get you that next step closer mm -hmm. to the yes, right? We have all gone out for that role, for that position, for that grad program, and been told no, right? It is a natural occurrence. So celebrate the no. Again, strap up your boots and get to work because the yes is coming. There's always a yes. It'll take a million no's for one yes, but that's all you need. You don't need for everyone to say yes, right? Because then you're doing too much, you're in too much. So when you get that rejection, take that as, okay, I've got work to do. I've got to improve in this area. I've got to enhance another, or I've got to learn, or, you know, I've got to take some more time. So always look at the rejection as an incubation period, as that time and that space to really connect with who it is that you need to be for the role that you seek. The yes is coming. It's inevitable. As the role turns, yeses will come. So celebrate those no's and really understand that they are for the making, that that's what's going to push you to the next yes. I just wanted to add, um, I don't believe in putting all your eggs in one basket. And so anytime that you're, you know, you use example about applying to college, you know, always have a backup plan. Mm -hmm. I'm very always. statistic. And so I already know what I'm going to do if I get a no. And so like, I, it's not so much that I don't care about it. And the other thing is I don't put, I don't put any, um, I believe in myself. I believe I'm pretty, pretty, you know, good in what I do. And so a rejection um, does not affect me because I believe in myself. Like it does not um, impact how I am as a, you know, a, a superwoman. Like it, I just keep moving. Like if you couldn't realize that or recognize that, that's your loss, move on to the next. And so have that strategy. Don't put your eggs in all, your, your eggs in all in one basket and just keep moving on like uh, Jason said. Yeah, I, I really like what Rose just said. And um that's that's how I that's how I view life um in general. Just, you know, the mental and your mindset is, is gonna make the difference at the end of the day. So my example would be um before I got to uh, Bethel Cookman, I had applied for an internship through the Smithsonian for the site that was here at Bethel Cookman and um I didn't get it. And you know, now now I'm here running the archive. So so you know it's it's all about how you how you how you spend it. Agreed. Just keep going, moving forward. Don't let anything stop you. Thank you all so much. This has been great. Um, 
And Rose definitely pointed out that this would have taken longer <laughs> than we thought. But this, this is such, it's so great, you know, just to have everyone come together and just talk about these things, encouraging each other um, to, you know, keep doing the work. Um, and so in respect of time for, you know, everyone here and those who might be watching from home or wherever, we're going to go ahead. Um, I put up the contact uh, information for everyone that you've heard from today. So go ahead, you know, get your, your um, those email addresses if you need. Um, if you're interested, um, I know specifically for form of fashion, they are um, interested in having an intern at some point. So please feel free, reach out. Don't be afraid. Or even if you are afraid, still do it um, because you don't know where, you know, where it can lead. Um, and then before we go, I do also want to um, encourage everyone to submit to our or contribute to our digital time capsule. During this time, we've been all working so much. Um, and so we're, we've created this time capsule to kind of mark this um, time in our lives. Um, and, you know, you can influence how the present will be remembered. So um, if you want to, to contribute to our Nights Stronger Together digital time capsule, um, go to guides.ucf.edu slash diversity week. And uh, you'll find the link right there below. Um, go ahead and submit anything you want. piece of art, media, anything you'd like. Um, and then finally, thank you. Thanks to everyone for being here. Um, again, thank you for the, to the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Thank you to College of Arts and Humanities. Um, thank you to Nicholson School, um, Student Media Today for being here. Um, and UCF Libraries for allowing me to go with this crazy plan, <laughs> this idea, um, and bring everyone together. So this has been absolutely great. Um, and yeah, we have tons of events for the rest of the week. Um, and so, yeah, please register, tell your friends, tell your, your colleagues, um, come on board and, and see what, you know, Knights are doing. Um, so, yeah, with that said, thank you all and have a great day. Here's to us. <laughs> thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Glenn. <laughs> thank you, Glenn. Welcome. You're welcome. Thank you, Glenn. You're welcome. Thank, thank you, Glenn. Thank you.